welcome to what I'm sure for many people here will be the, uh, the evening after the televisual evening, night and morning uh, before. I think we've all been glued to the, to the news channels. Um, I think we all know that this is a momentous day in the political life and foreign policy of the United States. How momentous is something we'll try to form some judgments about in the course of this evening. It's not easy, of course, to establish a sense of proportion and perspective on a campaign that has been fought in the most hyperbolic, brutal, divisive, post-factual, knock-down, drag-out manner in living memory, both within the two contending political parties in the primary stage and then between their ultimate candidates, and which has now produced a result that is as decisive as it was unexpected. Uh, for those, that is, who've retained the capacity to be uh, surprised in the last year and a half. It's not easy, but it's necessary, and that is what Dana Allen and Matthew Harries, editor and managing editor, respectively, of Survival, will try to do uh, on our behalf. The first challenge, I think, is to say something about what has happened, uh, why it has happened, and to try to locate the causes in secular or perhaps more transient features of American society and politics. And Dana is going to uh, lead on that. And then we'll need to reflect on some of the wider foreign policy implications, necessarily confining ourselves to some degree to what at this stage seems knowable or presumable. And this may still be a rather narrow category because President-elect Donald Trump's Maybe I should just let that uh, phrase hang in the air for a second, Dana. President-elect Donald Trump's most emphatic foreign policy assertions are also the ones still awaiting the greatest clarification. And discovering what is the balance in the slogan, America first, between classical isolationism and vigorous geopolitical hardball is just going to be the beginning of that exercise. So Dana will develop some thoughts on what a Trump presidency could mean, in particular for the West. And uh, Matthew will then expand on that and some other themes, including the significance of the confluence of Trump and Brexit. And then a matter which will be of interest to many people here, uh, trying to look at a specific policy area, namely uh, nuclear policy, which is one of the areas where we think we can make some uh, tentative pronouncements. So let me ask um, Dana to begin our discussion. Dana. Thank you, Adam. Um, yes, as Adam says, I'm going to um, <clears throat> focus maybe more on the United States and, and let um, uh, Matthew look at the broader implications. But actually, I, I, I'm going to do that with, with three basic questions. What will President Trump do? How and why was he elected? and encroaching a bit on Matthew's territory, but I, I think hopefully as a good handover, what, are the, what is the broader significance uh, for Western liberal order? The first one, what will President Trump do? Well, I'll, I'll talk about policies in a, in a moment. Um, there's a prior question, of course, about general fitness and temperament. Um, Donald Trump ran an overtly racist campaign. He got into politics on an overtly racist theme of birtherism uh, four years ago. And in various other ways, he has seemed rather er erratic um, and inattentive, let's put it that way. He has expressed huge admiration, not once, not twice, but repeatedly uh, for authoritarian rule by um, men like Vladimir Putin. This is terra incognita. Um, we have never had a genuinely illiberal president in my lifetime or, or arguably in American history. Certainly since World War II, Republicans and, and Democrats have all hewed and, and, and made policy within a basic liberal consensus, without exception. Um, this certainly includes uh, uh, George W. Bush, who was a liberal internationalist par excellence and probably to a fault. Um, it includes Richard Nixon, who was privately an anti-Semite, but whose public policies were well within the mainstream of American politics. 
and who incidentally proved to be a great friend of Israel's. Um, so, I mean, I think that's the general background. Uh, in terms of policies, if uh, we can only look at what he said he would do. He said he would reverse President Obama's climate change regulations because climate change is a Chinese hoax intended to ruin the U.S. economy. He said he'll deport 11 million undocumented in immigrants, insisting he'll do it humanely. Uh, but this is, this is a definition of humane that entails breaking up thousands of families. He said most his, his, his signature promise was to build, build a great wall with Mexico and extort the Mexicans into paying for it by threatening to cut off remittances. He said he would reinstitute torture for terrorist suspects and make it worse than waterboarding because even if it doesn't work in terms of intelligence gathering, they deserve it. He also said he would kill terrorist family members, the family members of terrorists, because it's the only uh, effective deterrence against someone who's willing to sacrifice his or her own life. He said if we do intervene in places like Syria and Iraq, against specific enemies like ISIS, we should do it in a way that is smart for American interests, which means at the very least seizing the oil uh, supplies there. He said he would tear up the nuclear agreement with uh, Iran, take a more transactional approach to the American alliance system. So for example, in his words, if the Baltic states cannot pay adequately for American defense, then congratulations, you are on your own. He said he would seek 35% and 45% tariffs on Mexican and Chinese imports, respectively. He most recently said he would sue the women who came forward to accuse him of sexual assault. Uh, previously, he promised to instruct the antitrust division of the Justice Department to go after the owner of the Washington Post, who happens to be Amazon's Jeff Bezos, because he was unhappy with the Post's coverage of his campaign. Um, and. Uh, Along the way, his family will continue to run his business, um, which was his answer to the question of whether he would put his business in a blind trust. Without, and this is not quite the definition of blind. Um, now, I know what you're thinking. Surely this is just campaign rhetoric, and he wouldn't actually implement it. Uh, to which my answer is, who knows? Um, it is true that there was a lot of contradiction and, and ranting in the campaign rhetoric, and so, so much so that it's difficult to analyze it as actual policy. As Matthew Iglesias said, it may be a, said at the time, it may be a category error even to try. Um, on the other hand, what else do we have to go on other than what, what he said? So I think, I guess the key question is, what constraints um, will President Trump be operating on under? What, constitutional checks and balances. Now, some of the agenda I just la laid out obviously constitutes war crimes. Uh, the former head of the CIA and various retired US generals have stated that America's spies and soldiers will refuse to carry out such orders. Uh, the candidate Trump's first response was that, well, if I order it, they will do it. Then he backed off a little bit. So maybe that is a fight actually that he wouldn't seek. Um, um, in general terms, Congress is in Republican hands and there are elements of um, this agenda, the trade wars and abandonment of NATO that are, are definitely at odds with the Republican consensus. Um, and other elements including the mass uh, deportation of, of undocumented immigrants are at odds with their um, long-term political interest in not permanently alienating uh, Hispanics, who are the fastest uh, growing segment of the American population. Although I say that that is in their long-term interest, I think that interest may not have, I mean, they may have missed out on that by this point. Um, so they could, the Congress could, could uh, exercise some constraint on these kind of issues. Um, I'm just not sure why we should expect uh, Republican congressmen and women's um, 
calculation of interest and ideology to be any different now that he has won than it was when he was a candidate and, and he received their support. Um, those cam I think the clearest thing we can uh, expect is that those campaign promises that fit with, re with the Republican agenda will be implemented. These include an abrogation of any action against climate change, um, appointments of conservative justices to the Supreme Court, very significant uh, upper, um, up, very significant marginal tax rate cuts, uh, which will probably require rather significant cuts to discretionary domestic spending, um, because partly because they will come with countervailing increases in defense spending, which I think the two things coming together are pretty likely to bring a return of massive structural federal budget deficits. A further restriction on a state-by-state -state basis of voting rights, um, for example, requirements for photo identification that are actually in many cases more expensive in real terms than the notorious poll taxes of the, of the age of segregation. Um, one area where I think um, allies, uh, America's allies might actually exercise some influence early on is on the question of abrogating the Iranian nuclear deal. Um, this is actually, I'm, I'm saying this on a basis of, a, of an exchange I had with my colleague Mark Fitztac Fitzpatrick before me coming up here. Um, and that might, be a, might actually end up being a fight that um, President Trump would not want because it, um, it would be an early one and it would um, certainly um, cause a lot of concert, consternation um, among allies. That's the best I can do at this point, but it's obvious we can, uh, we can discuss these issues. Um, I mean, I just want to, you know, make a rather maybe defensive point um, that this list of campaign promises was not um, was not put in any particular light. I mean, I'm just just reading what what he was saying. So. Um, I also probably should acknowledge that he uh, woke up, the, I mean, I woke up this morning, he, he was already awake, but he had given a rather conciliatory um, campaign uh, uh, acceptance speech. He, um, he thought the woman that he had um, promised um, would be in jail if um, he won the election. He did not repeat that and quite the opposite. He thanked her for her service to the, to the country. So. There, anything can happen, I suppose. Um, how did he win? Which I think is probably the question that a lot of you are asking. According to the latest New York Times projection, which I, I checked the update of it just before coming up here, Hillary Clinton will win the popular vote by more than a percentage point. So this is the fifth time in American history that the winner of the popular vote will lose uh, the Electoral College and therefore the presidency. And of course, it's the second time that this has happened in the last 16 years. In both those cases, the popular vote margin wasn't even particularly close. Hillary Clinton and Al Gore won both won by more votes than Richard Nixon's margin over human Hubert Humphrey in 1968 or John Kennedy's over Richard Nixon in 1960. Now, beyond any sense of moral uh, consolation, I suppose, that the Democrats might feel, this is significant uh, because the reason for it is closely tied, I think, to the structural reason that Trump won the Electoral College and Clinton lost. And I think it offers at least a partial insight into the motivation of Trump's supporters. Um, the, you know, we'll have to study the demographics uh, further, but it's pretty clear that a large percentage of his support came from rural and small town white voters without a college education um, in comparison to Clinton's more racially mixed and in some cases more highly educated urban voters. 
Or to put it in a slightly different way, and I'm borrowing this formulation from Ezra Klein, it was the vote of the losers against the winners of globalization. Um, so two quick observations on that. First, the reason that this is tied to the mismatch between the popular and electoral college votes is precisely because the urban winners of globalization are naturally gerrymandered. They are packed together tightly in more urban areas um, where the preponderance of democratic votes is wasted in, in electoral terms. And by the same token, a lot of Hispanic votes were wasted from, a, from the Democrats' point of view because of their concentration in California, which was safely democratic, and Texas, which for now remains safely Republican. The second point to make here is that this isn't just analogous to, it is exactly the same dynamic that led to Brexit. And I say that as someone who dismissed the statements, the warnings of so many people that um, Brexit was a warning that Trump could be elected. I think the dynamics were, were precisely the same. Now, who am I assigning um, as winners and losers of globalization in this explanation? Well, obviously, it's all relative. Um, Hispanic immigrants who voted for Clinton, or families of uh, descendants of immigrants who voted for Clinton, are no doubt, on average, <coughs> poorer than the white supporters of Trump. Uh, but they came to America for a better life, and despite you know, unquestionable hardships, they must feel that they are winning something. Um, black supporters of Clinton are also worse off on average, uh, but they have seen de decades of progress, and in any event, they've abjured the Republican Party for 50 years uh, since Barry Goldwater opposed the Civil Rights Act. I mean, you can say some thing, similar things about Asian Americans and Jews who by income strata seem to be natural Republicans but are highly um, allergic to racist or racialist uh, politics. Um, are working class whites, is it correct to call them the losers of globalization? Well, let's say that, that they certainly feel themselves as losers of an economic transformation which they may associate with the changing complexion of American society. And this brings me to the racial I issue. Trump, as I said, ran an overtly racist campaign. I don't think that statement is remotely debatable, but I'm happy to pick it up, uh, back it up if anyone wants to discuss it. So the appeal was racist, which is not quite the same thing as saying that the motivation and anger of his voters was racist. It might be better called a kind of white anxiety or white identity. Um, and I think it does have to be understood in the context of communities that really feel that they are slipping. You know, there was about a year ago, there was an astonishing study some of the methodology has been questioned, but the findings were nonetheless quite remarkable, um, that found that American middle-class white mortality has increased unlike, you know, I mean, it, I, I don't, I don't want to say it was at rates reminiscent of post-Soviet Russia, but it was, a, it was, it was an, an upward curve that is unmatched in any comparable country. Um, and it, the explanations for it are still being studied, but issues of um, opiate abuse, suicide, alcoholism um, were raised as possible explanations. Of course, the Republican Party made a strategic decision in the 1960s to be, and particularly under Richard Nixon, to be the home of whites who felt, southern whites who felt disaffected by civil rights and integration. Um, and the South progressively became the base of, of, of the Republican Party. Now, actually, I don't really think there's anything, in a certain sense, wrong with this, in the sense that, um, you know, Richard Nixon may have done a service in siphoning votes from the overtly racist George Wallace 
uh, into a more mainstream political party. Um, you know, what has happened now is that Trump has used Wallace language rather than Nixonian law language, and he's won the presidency with it. And the ground for this was laid, uh, I think, in the anger of the last eight, war eight years, in a, in a Tea Party that was so clearly directed against our first black pr president, in a decision in a, to, to basically pursue policies of blanket obstruction throughout his presidency. Um, as a means of kind of, I mean, this included, for example, the decision to, uh, to use the credit worthiness of the United States as a, as a means of extortion for policy, policy ends. The Republican Party officials were nonetheless obviously and genuinely astounded and to a large extent disgusted by Trump's success and his ultimate victory in the primary campaign. But this brings to me a set to a second reason, I think, that Trump won. In a polarized country, the decision of the institutional party and its elected to, uh, officials to back him made it okay for many Republican voters who had the, their doubts but were also driven by animus against the Democrats. Um, this is a point also that Ezra Klein uh, makes that Trump was in effect normalized by this official Republican support. Um, and when things like the tape about his um, uh, bragging about sexual assaults drove some of his voters away, the institutional backing of his party allowed them to come back in good conscience. conscience. As did, and I won't go into this because I'm really out of time, but as did their animus towards Hillary Clinton. And I do think we need to discuss in the Q&A, because I really don't have time now, the post-factual uh, media environment in which um, it became plausible to call her the most corrupt pres candidate in American history. Um, the emails were an astonishing, as I say, post-factual diversion, um, backed, it turned out, um, by a leak of other emails, um, possibly uh, or allegedly through Russian hack hacking. Uh, but it, it's quite astonishing that uh, someone who was hugely popular four years ago when she finished um, as Secretary of State could be so discredited by this moment. Okay, I'm, I've, I've taken too much time, but let me just say finally, um, as a kind of introduction to, um, to Matthew's points, it, it, it's really unknown territory. I mean, in, in terms of the consequences for liberal institutional Western, liberal Western institutions, the only thing I will say as an introduction, introduction to Matthew is that last spring, uh, or last winter, Ann Applebaum wrote a column in which she worried that we could be three elections away from the end of the West. Um, first, Brexit. Second, the election of Donald Trump as President of the United States. Third, the election of Marine Le Pen as President of France. Uh, well, we're two down, one to go. What are the precise mechanisms <coughs> by which these political events would lead to the breakdown of Western liberal order? I mean, I think, put most simply, they are solvents of solidarity. Um, the institutions such as the EU and NATO will survive, but they are being robbed of credibility and loyalty. Um, certainly, Nigel Farage, Donald Trump, and Marine Le Pen all welcomed Brexit because they, um, it was an expression of their genuine hostility to the European Union. Uh, President-elect Trump has expressed hostility towards NATO as a, basically just a bad deal for the United States. Um, and, uh, well, that's... You know, it, it leads me finally to the question, which is probably more for a Q&A, of um, what uh, countries or leaders might uh, step in to fit the, to fill, to fill
to fill the vacuum that I fear that is going to appear. Um, you know, I noted the other day, I, I noticed the other day that President Hollande has a, I, I thought this was possibly a misprint, has a 4% approval rating in France. Uh, but, you know, the French political parties are in the position to, to forge a kind of popular front against Le Pen, just as they cooperated against her father in, in, in the run-up to Chirac's election. Uh, I think Chancellor Merkel's strong leadership of Europe could be enhanced by the adaptation of sensible, which is to say expansionary fiscal policies that the periphery of Europe could live with. Um, Britain might say, on the back of a court decision, uh, that although its future is not in the EU, now is not the immediate time to leave it. But Matthew is going to tell me that, why that's impossible. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to pick up on Dana's theme of what the combination of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump might mean for the political solidarity of the West. But before I do that, I want to strike a slight note of caution, which is that if, if there's one characteristic of a Trump foreign policy which we can define now, I think it will be unpredictability. Um, as Dana alluded to, we don't necessarily know which of his foreign policy positions were um, exaggerated boasts in the heat of the campaign and which are points of principle. More specifically, we don't know what a Trump national security staff would look like. Um, and I think in that sense there is some limited scope for the shaping of a Trump foreign policy by the participation of some national security officials who had previously said that they would not serve a Trump administration. There's also an opportunity to shape the direction of a Trump administration, I think, in the um, transition period, and I think you're seeing that dynamic play out in the carefully worded and differently worded reactions of various um, international leaders, including Angela Merkel's um, interesting uh, offer of a partnership based on shared values, shared American values. <laughs> So what does uh, the combination of Brexit, Trump, uh, Brexit and Trump potentially mean for the political solidarity of the West? Before Brexit, before Brexit the solidarity of the West was um, under threat already. Uh, and I think the West and uh, Europe found themselves faced by non-Western autocratic powers, China and Russia foremost among them, overtly challenging the liberal international order, challenging the institutions of that order, the norms of that order, the rules of that order. At the same time, refugee movements uh, into Europe were providing fertile ground for the emergence of far-right movements. Um, and at the same time, Russia was testing and degrading uh, the European security architecture and testing and degrading NATO unity. I think it's important to point out, though, that in approaching this, these set, this set of challenges, the West is strong in aggregate material terms. Uh, it accounts for a third of global GDP. It accounts for more than half of global defense spending. But what unites these challenges uh, is that they all require a degree of political solidarity uh, to fix. So Europe can cope with the um, total number of refugees uh, entering, but only in the case of a lasting agreement to distribute the financial and the political burden of those numbers. NATO can arguably cope with the challenge from uh, Russia, but the, what gives Putin's strategy uh, potential leverage is the opportunity to exploit divisions within the alliance. And in this sense, Brexit undermined the solidarity of the West and added to these challenges. I would say in three respects. Firstly, it was a symbolic retreat um, from the spirit of cooperation. I think Brexit, the vote for Brexit has been interpreted 
as the UK prioritizing its own freedom of action over the shared gains that are available through a limited pooling of sovereignty. I think secondly, by definition, Brexit will remove British resources from European Union efforts. There may be ways of reintroducing those resources to European efforts, but um, by definition, they will be removed from EU efforts. And lastly, by undermining the EU and giving the EU a, a, an internal problem to um, consider, the vote for Brexit has made the EU less able um, in, a, uh, a, in a situation of limited resources and limited attention span to look outside its own borders. So in, in this context, what is the effect of the election of Donald Trump um, for, the, for Europe and, and for the UK? For the UK, um, the election of Donald Trump means that the UK has lost uh, or will soon be losing its EU membership at the same time as seeing the special relationship potentially undermined and NATO potentially undermined all in the space of five months, um, which is a significant strategic shock, I think. Secondly, for Europe, Europe has had problems with American administrations before, of course. But this is, in a sense, a certain kind of double whammy, which is that you might have had past presidents with whom Europe had ideological disagreements, but who were robust, sufficiently robust on uh, NATO and Russia matters to be reassuring, or you might have had a president who was European in political outlook and the worry might have been on the level of robustness vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But this is a double whammy of an illiberal president uh, in terms of values who appears um, predisposed to taking a transactional and perhaps sympathetic approach to uh, <laughs> transactional approach to uh, NATO and a sympathetic approach to Russia, um, which is a a new situation. Thirdly, the election of Donald Trump looks likely to compound the problem of damage to the international order. The international order that the West a few years ago I think would have assumed that its power would have operated through. So the US as an actor in multilateral uh, institutions and inter uh, multilateral diplomacy now I think will be at least more unpredictable um, and, and likely less constructive to obvious examples being in climate change negotiations and um, the upholding of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran's nuclear program. I think, though, it's possible, it's just possible, that the election of Donald Trump will direct attention to the incentives for European strategic cooperation despite the shock of Brexit. It may just focus attention on the need to make the best of things. Um, in practical terms, this touches on matters of defense and intelligence cooperation, both between the UK and EU, and the EU, but also the UK in bilateral relationships or minilateral relationships with European countries. Um, the problem here, I think, is one of rationalization, which is that there are obstacles as it stands to the combination of different approaches um, that the British prioritize, that Europeans prioritize, and different European states prioritize, but I'll come back to that. I think in political terms, the election of Donald Trump raises a strong European incentive to fix European problems in order to deal with the unpredictability of a Trump administration. And I think this is crucial. The political dynamic around Brexit, potential Brexit negotiations at the moment is increasingly acrimonious and increasingly zero-sum. And I think that an immediate incentive uh, in the UK and in Europe ought to be to find ways uh, to calm that uh, relationship down. It shouldn't be the case that the UK, France, and Europe are relitigating the inheritance of the Suez Crisis 60 years later. It shouldn't be the case that British um, preoccupation with the specter of a European army inhibits British support or at least non 
opposition to um, EU defence cooperation. There must be ways of removing those kinds of um, political obstacles to practical cooperation in Europe. Um, lastly, I think it would be remiss to discuss any of this without talking about money. Um, the reaction of the markets to Trump's election suggests we could be in really rough waters. None of what I've just discussed, none of that cooperation, none of that refocusing is possible, or at least none of it will be in any way easy um, in, a, in a time of uh, financial uncertainty and um, fiscal tightening. Lastly, I, Adam mentioned um, that I would discuss the, the nuclear weapons aspect of the Trump presidency. Uh, again, I speak with caution, um, but we can identify, I think, three areas of extreme interest. The first is proliferation. One aspect of this is potential, the potential for um, the non-proliferation effect of the US alliance system to be eroded, which is to say that you, the pressure to remain non-nuclear um, compensated for by US extended deterrence could erode. Now there remain significant barriers to US allies developing nuclear weapons. The US still has leverage. There are technological barriers. There are diplomatic barriers. Um, but the risk is certainly increased. Uh, secondly, although um, Dana mentioned some grounds for optimism, there's the possibility that Donald Trump will seek to unpick with the assistance of Republican Congress, uh, the JCPOA with Iran. The second area, and this is where things could get very unpredictable, is the area of arms control and strategic stability. It really isn't clear what approach a Trump administration would take to the general topic of arms control. There may be greater room for surprises and greater room for US uh, unilateral, unilateral, unilateral action in both directions than we may uh, immediately anticipate. But the third area, and the, the most worrying um, area, I think, is the question of nuclear use. Um, this is the area, of course, in which it's wisest to stay most cautious, but um, the personality traits that Donald Trump exhibited on the campaign trail um, I think were rightly identified by his opponent as, a, as cause for concern um, as a president. I think to make a more nuanced point though, in recent years you've seen a convergence of um, attitudes among the Western nuclear weapons uh, powers, the UK, US and France, to nuclear weapons. There's been a gradual convergence of uh, ideas about the scenarios in which nuclear weapons could be used, um, about deterrence postures, about the development of capability, about increased coordination between the three powers. The, a Trump presidency, I think, has the potential to disrupt that convergence um, in ways which um, have serious but hard to predict complications. Um, and I want to just conclude on a, on a final note of uncertainty. I think one of the th aspects of the um, campaign that was most interesting to watch was the shattering of previously held taboos and previously held shibboleths in American politics. And what I would be interested to see in a Trump presidency is whether there are fragile shibboleths in US foreign policy um, that could break when subjected to populist attention. So, for example, picture um, Donald Trump as president holding up the US-Saudi uh, alliance to populist scrutiny, uh, investigating the cultural affinity or lack of affinity between the two countries, investigating um, uh, what he sees as the, the, the motivations for that alliance. This is not to make any firm predictions, but it's to invite us all to ask which apparently firmly held principles of US foreign policy are uh, robust and which may be more fragile than they seem. Thanks.
Excellent. Um, thanks to you both. I think you've uh, done a great job in setting the table for uh, the discussion that we'll have over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. If you'd like to ask a question, make a comment, get my attention, follow the usual rules, wait for the microphone, identify yourself, clear and concise questions. Uh, you're the first to catch my eye in the third row, and then a few rows back. Yes. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the speakers for explaining as best they could how this idiot actually got elected in the United States. I, I, I've been, when I was a member of parliament for 36 years, I, I'm married to an American. I cannot possibly comprehend how that man won an election, being the United States, the most democratic country in the world. What I hope that we can do, and by we, I mean Europe, even though we're getting out, which is another issue, I'm appalled at it. We have to have a set of policies amongst the remaining democracies in the world on how we deal with this fool because he is very, very dangerous. I don't think he has the power to do things that other people would normally do. So my question is, how can the remaining democracies and even those American uh, individuals who are, must obviously be sick as hell every time they read what this guy does. Essentially, my question is, what can the democracies do to cope with this regime okay. which a decade or weeks ago was the most Yep, I think we have the sense of your, in the world. We have the sense what of your question. Can what can be done? done. Good. And then if three rows behind you, the gentleman had his hand up there in the middle of the row. Uh, thank you. Uh, Robin Ashby, uh, this is a short question which might have an even shorter answer. Uh, you've given us an awful lot of downside uh, in respect of, of Europe and the UK. Is there any upside in the election of President Trump? Okay. And then we'll take one final question on this round, and that's you, sir, in the, in the front. Thank you. My name's Norman Moss, a member of the ISS. Um, we're going to have you, somebody pointed out, you pointed out a Republican Congress. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean a Trumpist Congress. A number of Republicans have already, during the campaign, dissociated themselves from Trump. So how far can we count on Congress to curb some of his wilder notions. All right. Well, who wants to take a first stab at that? They had, a, I think, a bit of a common thread to them, so Dana. Um, yeah, maybe I'll go in, in reverse order. Well, I, I, I think I suggested um, I suggested the areas where Congress might resist um, Trumpism. Um, one is um, on trade issues. Um, the other is in a, in a professed tenant, you know, readiness to abandon NATO. I think those both would be um, at odds with, with, with Republican orthodoxy. But, you know, I think that um, at bottom, uh, the Speaker of the House, who, um, Paul Ryan, who expressed a lot of disquiet with some of the statements that Trump as candidate made. I mean, uh, he called one of his comments about a judge who was uh, overseeing, a, 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 overseeing those lawsuits against Trump University. I mean, there's some, a lot to discuss here, but he, 
um, called it the textbook definition of racism. Um, and, uh, you know, again, in, in terms of the, that notorious tape, he uh, expressed extreme distaste and then just said he was going to stop campaigning for him or was not going to start campaigning for him. But the basic reality is that they can, they, the, the Republican Congress does feel that they can count on President Trump to sign um, the bills springing from the Republican agenda. And, and um, Paul Ryan is, is more or less the author of that agenda. It, it includes very steep tax cuts and very steep cuts to domestic discretionary spending. Um, it includes a very conservative Supreme Court, which 24 hours ago looked almost certain to be flipped to be a, 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 a more liberal court, and now now its um, its conservative um, bent is going to be re-anchored for a at least a generation. So actually, I guess my I mean we can talk about specific issues. Um, beyond the two that I mentioned, uh, but I don't actually see the, the areas where you would expect the Congress to be a significant break. Upside of the election of Trump. There was, there was a moment in the, in, the, um, in the primary campaign when it seemed possible that because he was not tied to the orthodoxies, uh, you know, to the Republican, very conservative Republican dogma, that he might shake things up. Um, and uh, he, he, he was clearly a voice for a Republican base that was re felt rather ill-served by the um, by, 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 by a Republican agenda that seemed much more geared towards uh, high-earning bankers than towards um, uh, these white men without college degrees who are worried about their future. Uh, his actual policy agenda, though, has been very, um, on those sorts of issues, has been very conventionally Republican. So I don't know. You could see a, a degree of pragmatism. Um, the problem is that we haven't seen a, a great deal of focus in the candidate. Um, how do remaining democracies cope? Well, I suggested three things. Um, I think I suggested three things. Um, French, the French right and left gets itself together to successfully prevent Marine Le Pen from becoming president. Um, uh, the, Germany recognized the, that the responsibilities of leadership um, require a more pragmatic economic policy vis-a-vis -vis the Eurozone. And Britain um, uses this window to at least recognize that a, there, there are more important things in the world right now than a strict, um, a strict application of the dictum that Brexit means Brexit. Upsides, Matthew. Um, you could, it's a peculiar way of defining upsides, but you could, there, there are some who would say an upside of Russia's annexation of Crimea was that it gave NATO a sense of common purpose. You could say uh, in a similar way that an upside of the election of Donald Trump means that if Europe is ever to develop a sense of strategic purpose and unity it will be now, um, but that requires some contortions to see as, uh, as, as a net positive. Okay, we'll take another batch of three. Uh, first of all, uh, Yo Usumi on the aisle there, if you just put your hand up please. Thank you. It's working. It's Thank working. you very much. Uh, of course, uh, democrat democracy issue exist in Asia as well, but uh, this is an Atlantic context, so I want to ask Atlantic questions. Uh, on the defense budget of NATO or Europe as a whole, in this situation that European countries 
cannot help but increase the defense spending in response to what's being called. And, uh, and if that can materialize, can Trump be more or less convinced to honor Article 5 of NATO? What is there a window, is there a pathway in that NATO Article 5 is not going to be honored? As a result, there would be more sort of concrete and substantial uh, incursion from Russia in the military terms. Could you see that risk right lying ahead? Thank you. And then, gentlemen, yes, with your hand up just there. Uh, uh, yeah, with Trump previously calling Pakistan not a friend and, uh, and, uh, and questioning its relations with Pakistan, how do you think, uh, what would Trump's uh, attitudes and policies towards Pakistan be, especially because uh, Pakistan's uh, relations are, deter are deteriorating with India? So what will Trump's attitudes and policies be towards Pakistan? Thank you. And then uh, Hisham Hillier on the far right. No, 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 Hisham. You're next. Thank you very much, uh, Hisham Halia from the Atlantic Council and Rusi. Um, uh, just, I, ha I have this gnawing question in the back of my mind. First, I'm, I'm very pleased that you mentioned that um, unpredictability is the signature of any, uh, any analysis on Trump right now, um, because he's said mutually contradictory things on a variety of topics, uh, not least on the Middle East, which is uh, where I look most of all. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if we can rely on the Republican Party to not um, swallow some of the statements that they've made so far um, and not contribute to a Trump administration. I actually think that we'll, we'll be uh, surprised and um, perhaps shocked at how easily some people do that. Um, but my, my question is, is what damage has already been done? Okay, we're on the first day and already I can see a number of things very disturbing to me. Um, I've, uh, I've been watching how in the United States um, the far right has been extremely exhilarated actually by the events of the past 24 hours. Um, uh, former KKK leaders, uh, you know, applauding how they've managed to put a friend into the White House. Um, you've seen the far right um, in Europe also applaud this sort of decision. And insofar as all of us um, express our disdain and our, uh, our annoyance at somebody like Donald Trump becoming president, um, uh, I think it's fair to assume that people of color in the United States um, are feeling a lot worse. Um, Muslims are feeling a lot worse. Hispanics are feeling a lot worse. Um, and I'm not sure what other damage has already been done simply by today. So I'd, I'd appreciate if you could enlighten me as to what you think that might be. Great, thank you. And then uh, the lady by the, the window door. Hi, my name is Elena Cohen. This is my first visit to Double I Double S, and I'm very impressed by my esteemed colleagues. Um, my, well, I have two hats. Um, I'm the special advisor to the two all-party groups on um, tackling terrorism and international relations, but I have a new hat, which is special projects to the Shadow Minister for Europe. So I was very interested to hear about the European uh, project. Um, I have some sympathy with the um, party of Donald Trump because my own party is struggling with two factions and trying to unite uh, underneath a leader, which also has some quite interesting uh, pro um, policies. So, um, but as we've come together as a party to struggle with a, um, an emergence of members who not the Ku Klux Klan, obviously, but others who are not seen nationally as sympathetic to the British way of life, um, so will the American people. And I do believe they'll come together. So my question is, um, and my observation is from the rhetoric I'm hearing tonight, is that it's not doom and gloom. If you take out one statement from the whole campaign, which I picked up on, was uh, Donald Trump Jr. saying, well, wait a minute, Dad will be scrutinized. Dad will be scrutinized at every level. He's not a fool, he's a businessman. He will need to work with global leaders and he will want the Trump empire to extend globally so he will make alliances. So I think your, the, the downside has been overplayed tonight. I just want to make that observation. Good, thank you very much. 
Uh, Jefferson will respond to you there. I'll take I'll take the uh, I'll take the last one and um, and the third one, um, and maybe leave the other two to uh, Matthew, which are more difficult. Um, I you know I just uh, look I don't know the future and I don't uh, you know life goes on, um, but you said something extraordinary it seems to me when you said um, one reason uh, to be reassured is that he will want the Trump empire to do well. I mean, this is, uh, this is another place we've never been in the entire history of the United States, to have a president who has m massive business holdings, which he is proposing not to put in a blind trust. I mean, there are, there, there's a word for that. It's called kleptocracy, and we, we're familiar with, them in other, with it in other countries, but we've never, ever seen it in the United States. So I just can't see that as a reason for reassurance. And in fact, it's gotten me agitated, as you can tell, just thinking about it. <laughs> By the um, way, the first millionaire in the United States was? <laughs> the, first, the first millionaire? George Washington. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> I, 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 I um, am, am impressed. Um, yeah, he probably didn't put his holdings in a blind trust either. Okay. Um, uh, what damage has already been done? I mean, I think you partly already answered your question, but I think it's worth, worth noting that this has been a very, very uh, dispiriting political campaign that has normalized previously abnormal behavior, and particularly in, in, in regard to race relations in the United States. I mean, in my list of, um, of promises, I somehow left out the promise to ban Muslims from entering the United States. I don't, can't quite, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is the evidence is mainly anecdotal, but it's quite vast of school children, white school children, using you know the words Trump, Trump to taunt uh, their Hispanic uh, classmates or Hispanics of a, of a, of a, of a rival school. Um, this is a, um, you know, a few, 24 hours ago we were talking about the um, possible effects just of the fact of, a, of, a, of the first woman as president and what that might do to gender relations in the United States. Um, I think we have to um, uh, be very concerned about sort of the, the illiberal discourse that's run through this campaign and, the, and the, the damage it's already done. Now, it's quite possible, I don't really see evidence for it except in his acceptance speech, it's quite possible that the new president will um, see it as his duty to, um, to strike a very different tone as president. But, you know, there's one piece of evidence of that for that so far. Um, I will make a partial attempt at answering the NATO question. Um, Pakistan, I, I think the answer, I refer back to the unpredictability of a Trump foreign policy, but too early to call. Um, but from last night, we know what too early to call usually ends up as. So. Um, on NATO, U.S. interests, U.S. material, political, social, cultural interests in the strength of NATO remain as strong today as they were before the election of Donald Trump. Um, there, and there's, there, it, it's possible to read a difference, although I express concern about the way that Trump has talked about NATO, it's possible to read a difference between bombastic language about the financial transaction involved in the alliance and how the US would react to um, an Article 5 type scenario, but um, again, uh, we'll have to wait and see. But the, the interests, the US interest in the strength of NATO is the same uh, as it was before Donald Trump was elected, so I think that should be cause for comfort and it should also be cause for 
NATO and European countries to rally round and remind um, themselves and the United States of that, of that fact as, as loudly as possible. Thank you. Then right at the very back, um, gentleman with his hand up. Uh, hi, uh, I just want to ask about the special relations between Britain and the United States. Uh, at one time, some people say that Trump will not be welcome here, but n now that he's got elected, and uh, oh, how would you see the future of the transatlantic relations? Will, we, will it be uh, further strengthened or remain as it is? Thank you. Then we have two questioners in the same row sitting next to each other. Uh, I think, uh, if you just come down, Becky. Uh, third row. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Merdat Konsari, a member of the Institute. Uh, on on uh, Trump's comments regarding the JCPOA, uh, and of course, contradictory comments regarding U.S. relations with Iran, in other words, that the U.S. should be part of the beneficiary parties in terms of doing business with Iran or getting involved in Iran's reconstruction, things that we've set to that order. Uh, oddly enough, the, according to pundits in Iran, the majority of the hardliners had favored uh, Trump's election, fearing that you know, uh, Hillary Clinton is too much tied to the Jewish lobby in the United States and Saudi lobby and so on and so forth. Uh, would, you, would you consider this sense of optimism on the part of the Iranian hardline as, a, as an upside to what might potentially develop, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, his business sense wanting to prevail as opposed to something that he was just sloganeering about? Thank you. If you could hand the microphone to the gentleman on your right. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, a, a quick supplementary question on, on the uh, special relations. said that uh, Britain would go to the back of the queue. I think this is for, uh, for Dr. Harris. Uh, uh, Trump has actually said that that would not be the case. He didn't say Britain would be at the front of the queue. He did say it would be uh, certainly in nothing like that position. Uh, perhaps I could also ask about Syria. Um, I think Hillary Clinton's <coughs> perspective policy on Syria uh, was very different. Thank you. Do you want to start this time? Yeah, uh, on the special relationship, um, I mean, like all the rest of this, uh, it's too early to tell, but um, the common interests of the UK and the US have not changed with the election of Donald Trump. And there is a deep and long lasting working level cooperation on uh, nuclear issues and on intelligence. Um, that has endured political disruption before um, and one might expect to continue so um, it's it's too I think it's too early to make much prediction I think it's true that it's um, the election of Donald Trump is an unfortunate contrast to the argument that was aired during the um, EU referendum campaign that the withdrawal from the Euro European Union would be compensated for by reliance on um, the transatlantic relationship um, because the, introducing that element of unpredictability obviously isn't good. Um, on the question of being at the back of the queue for trade deals, I mean, the problem is, of course, the, is the legal position of the UK as a member of the European Union and its ability to negotiate trade deals. So there is a, there's a practical obstacle, whatever the, the intent. Um, on the G JCPOA, all I say is I don't share the um, the hardliners' premise about uh, where uh, the sources of um, Hillary Clinton's support. Um, so in that sense, I, I'm not sure I would I would uh, share the, the conclusion either. Yeah. 
Well, there is a, there is a definition of the special relationship that, um, I mean, I'm not, this is not the concept of the special relationship going back to Churchill, but it is a, a recent version of it that is, uh, it seems to me, a kind of fig leaf for hostility towards the European Union. I mean, not just not wanting to be a member of it, but being actively hostile to the European Union um, and wanting to see it fail. I mean, that's, uh, that may seem overly harsh, but I have heard this kind of rhetoric and this attitude in, in, in Britain. And um, if that's your definition of a special relationship, I'm not saying it is yours, but I mean, if that's one definition of it, yes, Trump has something to offer there, I suspect. Um, in very clear contrast to uh, the position of the Obama administration, which was that you know the Obama administration um, practically begged, begged Britain to stay in the EU because it thought that a strong EU with Britain in it was a strong American interest. So I think it's quite possible that uh, President Trump will have a different view, and maybe there will be interesting possibilities there. I tend to agree with the Obama view of the things, so I'm not too attracted to those possibilities, but they, 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 may, they may exist. On Syria, um, I think, you know, to the extent that he's expressed views that are coherent, Trump's sort of realism on steroids. I mean, he has said I mean, among the occasionally, um, you know, pragmatically astute things he has said, one of them was it, to the effect that it's very difficult to fight two sides in a civil war. Um, and he's, um, he has stated that he'd be happy to be on Assad's side um, against, against ISIS. So if there's any, um, you know, you know if, if there was any sense that a Clinton administration would be more interventionist than the Obama administration was against Assad, against uh, Russian and Iranian support for Assad, I don't think that's, that's going to be the case. Well, to have a concluding round, and this is going to be uh, blue on blue, because I've got three members of the ISS research staff who have asked to intervene. So we'll see what sort of intellectual coherence we can uh, muster between us. Uh, first of all, uh, Ben Barry, please. Dana, what do you think the effect is going to be on the Democratic Party? Uh, will it melt down and go into the wilderness, as we've seen at least one and a half times in my lifetime, the Labour Party do? And then Pianoel. Yes, interesting because there's, there's a link to, to uh, the question we've just, we've just heard, actually, and it, it's on trade. If you look at the map that the New York Times has today, which is a fantastic map about uh, where the gains and the losses or the gains of the two parties were compared to uh, the previous election, actually, you know, almost all of Trump's gains compared to uh, the Republican candidate last time are in regions of the US that have suffered badly from deindustrialization. And it's the same in France with, with Le Pen. The UK story, I know a bit less the economic geography, but there's, a, there's an element, there's an undeniable element of the populist wave, so to speak, that is about the very rapid, wide-scale impact uh, of you know, this quite recent phenomenon of trade, free trade, or nearly free trade, between nations of very different, very different levels of wages and very comparable uh, levels of technological ability. I mean, you know, what democracies could do now, perhaps liberal Western democracies could do to address, maybe it's time to ask if free trade, as we've done it over the past 10, 15 years, is actually politically compatible, sustainably compatible with liberal democracy in, a, in, in, a, in, rich, in rich, diverse societies as ours. And, and if it's not, then you know, maybe, 
maybe Trump is right, maybe for the wrong reason, or, or is right on this and completely wrong on other stuff, but maybe it is really time to uh, roll back the, uh, the, the international trade policy of the past 15, 20 years. Okay, and then uh, Antonio Sampaio in the front row. Um, I'd like to ask a quick question about basically the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of um, the US role in intervention and uh, being the policeman of the world has been uh, raised several times, but it is also um, a crucial actor in international uh, development aid and humanitarian action. So not only on the security infrastructure and the geopolitical infrastructure or, or, or um, system of, of the West and by extension uh, a lot of the world, but um, peace building uh, and the so-called nation building in countries in which it is not uh, so directly involved anymore. Um, in the Middle East and Asia. Uh, so what, is there any glimpse of what uh, Donald Trump would mean for US uh, international aid and humanitarian action abroad? Okay, who wants to begin? Um, <clears throat> Antonio, I mean, the, the, in narrative and rhetorical terms, the indications are obviously not good in the, on the grounds that Donald Trump ran on, ran on a campaign of fixing America's problems before it focused on the rest of the world. Um, in operational working terms, it's not yet clear. I mean, there is no, there, I think at this point there is no other answer than that. Um, but it's unlikely to be good news. Um, ben, on your point about the, Demo uh, the question about the Democrats, I don't know what everybody's um, choice of channels was last night, but I was watching NBC and James Carville um, uh, was one of the pundits and he said essentially that the Democrats are already in the wilderness that um, not only do, is the president Republican both houses of Congress Republican with Republican nominations to come to the Supreme Court you also have Republican control of I think what 31 governor's mansions you have Republican control of um, state legislatures across the country um, you have, uh, as Dana mentioned, um, electoral redistrict redistricting that makes the House incredibly hard to take. Um, the Democrats, I think, are there at this point, um, and uh, it's it won't be easy to, to, to come back. Dana. Well, um, I'll give a slightly different gloss on that last question. Um, I, I mean, Matthew is entirely correct that institutionally the Republican Party is in great shape. I mean, it, it holds, um, uh, I mean, it, ideologically, I think it has a lot of problems and how it's gonna, you know, accommodate its president um, is gonna be a very interesting four years. I mean, interesting in, you know, in the Chinese sense, which, um, um, but, um, to describe a Democratic Party meltdown, uh, I, you know, I'm sure to a lot of Democrats, you know, frankly, including this one, it felt like a meltdown last night. But um, it was also the night uh, that the Dem that the Democratic candidate for president won the popular vote for the 1992, 1996, 2000. 2008, 2012, 2016. For the sixth time in seven elections, the Democratic Party has won a majority of the national vote. Now it was of the popular vote. It was a thin majority. It won a 1% 1 margin. I mean, this is still, you know, the votes are actually still being counted. Um, but it does, it, it certainly doesn't refute the thesis of, of demographic change in the United States, which is going to favor the party that is the coalition of more diverse ethnic groups. Um, uh, as Matthew, you know, to repeat, I agree totally with Matthew. From that actually very strong position, it has found itself in a miserable situation. Um, it, is, it has played a very good hand 
well, I'm not sure how it played it, but it has a, the effect of playing a very good hand badly. Uh, but the demographic uh, future of the United States does not favor the Republican Party uh, in its current configuration. And, you know, I mentioned Barry Goldwater a while ago. Um, that was more than 50 years ago. That was 52 years ago, the election of 1964. American blacks have never looked back. They've never given the Republican Party a second chance. And uh, it's hard to see when, you know, it would not be surprising if American Hispanics, you know, won't look at the Republican Party for an, also for a half century. Um, um, Pierre, uh, you know, I'm certainly open to your, um, your suggestion. And, you know, I think one thing that one has to credit Trump for is that he was the first overtly protectionist presidential candidate, and it helped him a lot. And um, it's one of those things where maybe the shibboleth of free trade has, has deadened political and even economic um, thoughtfulness. I mean, but I think the problem is par arguably deeper. I mean, I, you're, you're much more of an economist than I am. But um, is it really about trade or is it about economic transformation that includes a future in which artificial intelligence is going to wipe out, you know, even the possibility of a jobs-based economy? And we're going to have to find a different way to, we'll have great wealth, but we'll have to find a different way to distribute it. So I think the challenge is um, monumental and in terms of the capitalist system, maybe yet existential. Um, and I'm not sure how much of it has to do with trade, although it has something to do with it. Okay, I'd just like to say four things. Uh, one is it's now our pleasure to offer you a drink at the back and uh, to invite you to engage in further discussion. We've got eight members of the ISS research staff, all of them excellent, sitting in the front row. They'll be mingling and no doubt uh, talking with you about their specialized areas. Um, secondly, uh, to remind you that um, on November the 17th, our next event, 2.30 at Bloomsbury House, our second site, will deal with Russia's role in the geopolitics of uh, the Middle East. And the speakers will be two members of the ISS Council, uh, Amos Yadlin from Israel and Igor Jürgens from, uh, from Russia. And I can't actually read my other two points, <laughs> except the last one I know is definitely to thank these two for their presentation. <laughs> so let's just end it there. Thank you very much indeed.